Mr Beer. So before um, we hear the evidence of Mrs Anne Chambers, um, I should inform you of a um, significant development in relation to the evidence of Gareth Jenkins, from whom we were due to hear evidence on Thursday and Friday of this week. Um, as you know, the inquiry served a written request pursuant to Rule 9 of the Inquiry Rules 2006 on Mr Jenkins, seeking a witness statement from him in relation to the issues that arise in Phase 3 of this inquiry on the 31st of August 2022. And that request contained 56 numbered questions, although many of the questions contained sub-questions, meaning that some 200 questions were in fact asked, set out over 17 odd pages. Um, after resolution of the issue of whether you should write to the Attorney General to ask her to provide an undertaking that any evidence given by or produced to the inquiry by a person would not be used against that person in criminal proceedings against them was resolved, you determined that you would not presently seek such an undertaking but would keep the position under review. Mr Jenkins provided a witness statement to the inquiry on the 6th of February 2023. At that witness statement was short, uh, 15 pages in length, and addressed the small number of the questions that had been asked of Mr Jenkins. Um, it did not address the issue of Mr Jenkins' knowledge of and involvement in the investigation of a series of bugs, errors and defects in the Horizon system. Uh, that issue was the principal issue raised by the inquiry's written request. In particular, it didn't address at all questions 16 to 49 in the inquiry's written request, all of which went to the issue of knowledge of bugs, errors and defects. Uh, in relation to the questions which were not addressed in the witness statement, Mr Jenkins said, quote, I wish to maintain my reliance on the privilege against self-incrimination in relation to certain of these questions for the time being, but I want to make clear my reasons for doing so. As matters stand, my lawyers are working their way through the evidence, disclosed the core participants by the inquiry, and will continue to do so. I understand that at the present time, they are unable to advise me fully on the privilege against self-incrimination, particularly in relation to phase four, because their review is ongoing and because the existing evidence disclosed in, in relation to phase four is limited. I wish therefore to ensure that it is understood that I will continue to keep the question of whether I waive my rights under consideration. My lawyers have undertaken to the inquiry to notify it in good time when they are in a position to advise me fully. I will continue to prepare for the inquiry so as to ensure that when my lawyers are in a position to advise me, that is not a cause for delay. On Friday of last week, the inquiry received a letter from Mr Jenkins' solicitors stating that they and Mr Jenkins had continued to review the material disclosed by the inquiry, that although disclosure was a rolling process and disclosure in relation to phase four in particular remained very much ongoing, they had a greater understanding of the evidence that relates to Mr Jenkins in phase three and that having had the opportunity to consider the disclosure, Mr Jenkins wished to indicate his willingness to provide the inquiry with a response to the request that was served on him on the 31st of August 2022 in a statement which addresses all of the questions asked in that request. Uh, this is plainly an important development. In the light of it, you decided that Mr Jenkins should not give evidence on Thursday and Friday of this week for three main reasons. First, that it was in the interest of the inquiry, of the core participants and of the public that the inquiry should receive the widest range of evidence possible, in particular um, from a central figure such as Mr Jenkins. It was therefore important to obtain this written evidence from Mr Jenkins. Secondly, it would have been unfair on core participants, and in particular the sub-postmaster core participants, for Mr Jenkins to have entered the witness box on Thursday and Friday of this week without him having previously provided a written account of what he proposed to say about errors, bugs, and defects in the Horizon system. It's important that all core participants have the opportunity properly to prepare for witnesses and giving evidence without previously having made a statement on the issues of substance would have undermined that preparation. And thirdly, if Mr Jenkins had been permitted to give evidence without having made a statement, it would have involved treating Mr Jenkins differently from other witnesses because it may have allowed Mr Jenkins free reign in his oral evidence to say what he wished without having previously reduced his account to writing. In the light of the time that it's needed to produce that statement, 
disclose it to the inquiry, the inquiry to assess whether it properly engages with the questions that we've asked, and to disclose that statement in good time before Mr Jen Jenkins gives his oral evidence, it will not be possible for him to give evidence in the phase three oral uh, evidence sessions that remain in this part of the inquiry, i.e. in the next three weeks. We will instead interpose Mr Jenkins's phase three evidence at a convenient moment in phase four of the inquiry, but before the summer break. Fair notice of this evidence will be given on the inquiry's website in the usual way. Mr Jenkins will in any, any event be required to make a written statement about the issues which arise in phase four of the inquiry, in particular his role in criminal and civil proceedings taken against sub-postmasters, and return for a second time to give oral evidence about such matters in phase four of the inquiry, most likely after the summer break. It follows that the inquiry will not be sitting this Thursday and Friday, but the remainder of phase three will continue in accordance with the timetable next week. Mr Beer, thank you very much for explaining to everyone the decision which I took last Friday and the reasons for it. So, Anne Chambers, please. I do solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Um, good morning Mrs Chambers, my name is Jason Beer and I ask questions on behalf of the inquiry. Can you give the um, inquiry your full name please? Anne Olivia Chambers. Before I ask you any um, further questions, the um, chairman um, has a statement that he wishes to make. Well, Mrs Chambers, you have already heard uh, Mr Beard explain that Mr Gareth Jenkins has in the past at least relied upon what we call the <coughs> principle of privilege against self-incrimination. Before we go any further, I should tell you that a witness at a public inquiry has the right to decline to answer questions if there is a risk that the answer to the question would incriminate the witness. In short, that is the principle of privilege against self-incrimination. I remind you of that principle before you give your evidence. I must tell you that it is for you to make clear to me if you wish to rely upon the privilege if therefore questions are put to you by Mr Beer or any other counsel or by me which you do not wish to answer on the grounds that to answer the question might incriminate you, you must tell me immediately. At that point I will consider your objection and determine whether or not to uphold it. I understand that you are represented by a barrister and solicitors today, no doubt if the issue relating to self-incrimination arises, they will assist you. And if at any stage of the questioning you wish to speak to your lawyers about that principle, you must tell me immediately and I will facilitate that. Do you understand all that, Mrs Chambers? Yes, I do. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mrs Chambers, for coming to give evidence um, to the inquiry today. And thank you for um, providing a long and detailed witness statement to the inquiry to assist us in our work. Uh, we're very grateful to you. You should have in front of you a hard copy of that witness statement. It's in tab A1 of that bundle. It's in your name and is dated the 15th of November 2022. Have you got that witness statement? Yes, I have. If you turn to page 63, please. Yes. Is that your signature? Yes, it is. And are the contents of that witness statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. For the purposes of the transcript, the URN is WITN 0170 There's no need to display that. Mrs Chambers, I'm going to ask you some um, questions today and tomorrow about the issues that arise in phase three of the inquiry. 
we're going to ask you to return at a later stage in the inquiry to answer questions that arise in phase four of the inquiry, in particular about the role that you undertook investigations of sub-postmasters and giving evidence in proceedings brought against them, and in still further particular, the evidence that you gave in the Lee Castleton case. Do you understand? Yes. Um, all core participants should respect that divide or division if and when they come to ask you questions tomorrow, and I and the chair will be keeping a watchful eye to ensure that that process is um, respected. Yeah. Um, I should make it clear that I know that you have spent many hours preparing to give evidence today and have been diligently looking at some of the material that the inquiry has sent you. You were, I think, provided with a considerable volume of material at the time you were asked to prepare a witness statement on the 6th of October 2022. You've been provided with much more material since then, including in the last two weeks. And I think we're dealing with such a large volume of material that you couldn't have hoped to have read all of it and digested it. Is that right? That's right, yes. And if at any stage I show you a document with which you're not familiar, that hasn't been part of your preparation, then just say so. Yes. Um, can I start, please, with your career, qualifications and experience? Um, do you have any professional qualifications that are relevant to the issues that we're going to discuss in your evidence? Um, I have a degree in statistics and mathematics, which I think sh shows that I've got a reasonable sense of numeracy and so on, which I think is relevant. Probably more than that, a degree in um, statistics with pure maths, I think, yes. obtained um, from the University College of Wales in 1978, is that That's right? That's correct. And your first employment, I think, after um, graduation was with a company called DataSkill, is that right? Yes, it was part of ICL. Um, it was ICL Software House. And before you joined um, Data Skill, did you have any formal qualifications in computing? No, I'd done a couple of computing modules as part of my degree, um, but I hadn't done a great deal of, of computing. I think, like most people at that time, I, I learnt on the job. And you say in your statement that um, at Data Skill, you coded and supported um, various um, uh, software packages, is that right? That's correct, yes. And was that software concerning um, databases and statistical processes? Yes, it was. But to what extent is that the same or different from what you went on to do um, at ICL and then Fujitsu? Um, it was quite similar. Um, in a lot of ways. I mean, I, I didn't actually leave data skill as such. It just merged into, um, it was sort of assumed into ICL. Yes. So I then carried on working on the, the same type of things. Um, as the years went by, I did less coding and so on, and I found I enjoyed the, the support work. You tell us in your statement that from 1986 you worked from home and were working part-time as a software um, diagnostician, is that right? Yes, that's right. I had first one and then two children, and there was a group of people within ICL who were all home-based. Uh, our management were mostly home-based as well, and with what now seems like very prehistoric comms and, and equipment, we could actually do our job remarkably well. What um, does a software diagnostician do? Some, a user of a piece of software that you are supporting somewhere in the world uh, discovers there is a problem with it. Um, at the time, they would sort of fill in a, a paper form saying <laughs> what the problem was that they'd encountered. And then it was up to me to look at evidence provided. Sometimes it was great heaps of... of dumps that you had to sort of work out how to read your way through to try and work out what had gone wrong, identify the problem and at that time work out how to fix it, usually by applying something that was called a, a patch rather than a, a actually changing the code. Just um, stop there, there's a, a noise that I don't know whether other people can hear, it seems to be coming through the air conditioning vents. 
Um, well, is, is it me or...? No, it's not you, Mr Beard. It's certainly very noticeable where I'm sitting. And um, for a moment, I thought we were outside in a storm. If this, is, if this is troublesome for you giving evidence, Mrs Chambers, we'll try and do something about it. Is it bothering you? I think I can ignore it as long as it doesn't get too much louder. All right. Well, uh, the usher is going to try and make some investigations, but we'll carry on for the moment and see where we go. Yes. You, in your, the answer that you just gave, you said that someone somewhere around the world had found a problem with the system. Was a, would a software diagnostician always be responsive to somebody else finding a problem? Or would they, um, uh, in some cases, proactively look for um, code faults, um, errors or bugs in the software? In these particular instances that I was supporting at that time, it was <laughs> dependent on somebody re reporting the problem to us. So it was always reactive? Yeah, it was very reactive. And so you would investigate error reports, is that a good yes. way of describing them, um, filed by users? Yes. And um, would a fair way of describing what you did would produce code fixes? Yes, or produce patches to the code. Yeah. Uh, that changed when you went on later to work for the SSC. You did the former but didn't produce code fixes, is That's that right? That's right, yes. I had been doing, it was usually called false line support, so it people would have already checked for published known errors and things like that, although sometimes things got through. Um, once I moved on to the post office work, I was third line support where we were doing a great deal of the investigation, but we would not actually be fixing the problem ourselves and not necessarily finding the root cause of the problem ourselves. Can I look at this um, early stage before October um, 2000 and your um, early involvement in Horizon? Mm -hmm. You tell us in your witness statement, paragraph three, no need to turn it up, that from 1997 uh, you did some coding and support in respect of part of the new pathway system for the post office. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Now, the purpose of uh, the questions I'm about to ask you is to establish... Um, what you did learn, if you um, did learn things, as a result of your early involvement in the development of what became Horizon. Do you understand? Yes. Um, in which team were you working from um, 1997 onwards until um, October 2000? Um, I was still working for my off-site team. I think we were called ICL Systems at that point. I was still doing supporting other systems as well as working on the this particular niche area of, of post office. And um, who was your manager or um, supervisor at that time? Um, I think my manager was Sheila Powell. I mean, she, but again, as I say, she wasn't post office. On the, the, she wasn't part of the ICL pathway team. This was still part of this separate structure. And were you still home based at this time or had yes, you gone back into the office? I was still home based. And did you ever go into the office in this period, sort of October 97 to, uh, sorry, 1997 till October 2000? Um, as regarding the pathway work in that period, I remember going to Feltham, I think, once, May, and I remember giving a couple of training sessions in, ver in a different locations. Concerning the Post Office Benefits Agency project? Yes. Can I just explain this, this area that I was working on. It was the transfer of files out of the benefits agency. There was some transformation done um, so that they could then be fed into the back end of the, the, the pathway system. Um, I was going to ask you about that because your witness statement um, suggests that you were involved in the benefits agency side of the coding. Yes, it, well, it, it was a funny sort of lump in the middle, but the benefits agency side of it used VME, which was ICL's proprietary operating system, or one of them, and that was what I was particularly um, an expert in, if you like. And was it restricted um, to that? And that was my, my only involvement, was the 
manipulation, the, the transformation that was done on the data in these files and the transfer into the, the back end of the post office system. But I didn't know any more about what happened to those files. Well, and I knew nothing about the, the counter end of, of the post office system at that time. And how long did this work on the pathway system um, by you last? Um, I still had some involvement by the time I joined the SSC um, because by that time there was only about one file left that was being processed. Uh, I think it was to do with child benefit, if I, th I think that's right. Um, and I was still providing some level of support for that. So from 97 until October 2000, albeit doing other jobs for um, ICL, yeah. um, involved in the pathway system in the way that you ex um, explained? I had some involvement, yes, yeah. certainly by 99 there wasn't it, it was just sort of support of this one file that was that was being transferred so I was doing quite a few other things then as well um, the inquiry has heard evidence that there were um, systemic design problems um, um, uh, with the development of horizon from the outset including in respect of the um, integration of pathway and benefits and post office systems and has heard evidence um, of problems with the requirement specifications for the project. In general terms, in that um, three-year period, were you aware of um, such problems at the time? Only in as much as the, the vast majority of it was, was canned and the, the relationship obviously was would appear then not to have been particularly good, but no, I had no direct knowledge of that. What was your understanding um, for the, of the reasons that the majority of it, the project, was canned? Uh, just that the different bodies involved couldn't work out properly how they wanted it all to work together. I don't know. I... I I wasn't involved in any of the, the political side of it, if you like. I was, have always been very much technical and not involved in the, the, the more political and perhaps commercial aspects. But you picked up that it was a problem with the parties working together that was the problem, is that right? I think that was the impression I got at the time. Did you pick up anything else, that it was a problem with the... Um, the system or the quality of the Horizon system? No, because I don't think, I mean, I, I don't think I knew particularly what happened to the, the data <laughs> that was in the files that, that we were passing on. So That's one way, but in, um, that you may have learned, i.e. Mm. Um, feedback on the issues upon which you were working, but um, I'm talking about talking to your colleagues, um, receiving emails, um, attending I, meetings. I don't recall any of that. And so was the extent of your knowledge that the majority of the project was canned, that it was to do with a relationship problem rather than technical issues with Horizon itself? I th think that was the impression I got at the time, yes. Can we look please at um, poll? Um, 3091901. That should come up on the screen for you. You should see that this is um, an operational review um, of the CAPS, um, CAPS meaning Customer Accounting and Payment System. Yes? I can't remember <laughs> if that's okay, what it stood it for, me. but yes, it could well have done. Um, I mean, if, if um, you want to look ahead to page uh, nine of the document and at the foot of the page. 
um, caps in um, uh, this sense, um, customer accounting and payment system. Can you see that? Yes, I can see that. If we just go back to page one, please. So operational review of the CAPS pathway um, interface. Yeah. Um, it's dated the 26th of February, 1998. Yeah. And if you look at the distribution list, I think um, you're on it. Yes. Um, the, the O being um, Olivia. Yeah. Um, and we can see that on the right-hand side, second um, entry. And can we go, please, to um, page um, 61 of the document? And look at paragraph 6.3.8.2, the second paragraph down. Um, the document reads, and Chambers ICL Systems has expressed doubt that next action time can actually be explained convincingly um, as it is, and that CAPS and Pathway should get together to produce a proper definition of the requirement. A definitive specification would provide a basis for reviewing the current implementation, as well as a document that would be useful in supporting the um, at the live service. So you, you're reported in this document as saying that um, CAPS and Pathway, so is that essentially the benefit agency part of the programme and ICL should get together? Yes, I mean, we've got a, a file that's, or files that are being transformed and passed over and it's obviously important that both sides agree exactly the definition of the, the data that one is sending and one is receiving. And so would this be an example of there being some um, doubt or ambiguity, whoever's fault it was? Yes, it didn't seem as if this had been properly defined because um, I can't remember, I think by the time I got involved this the, the code had already been written, um, but I think this was a particular field that, that we were having some problem making sense of exactly what it was meant to, to contain, and the assumption had been made that it should be like that, but it wasn't clear that that, that was correct. I presume you've got no memory of this now? No. no. Very, very, very vague memories, and I, I certainly couldn't tell you how it was and how I thought it should be, or anything no. like that. But the issue of um, there not being a proper definition of the requirement, that's the customer's requirement, yes? Yeah. Uh, can you recall whether that was a, um, in this sort of three-year period, something that happened often, or a, a recurring issue? I don't remember that, no. I think, I mean, it, it would only be at the point that these files actually started being, using the, the, the code that had been produced and that once they were actually being processed, um, that then you'd have some debate about <laughs> whether these things were, were actually as both parties had understood. Can we go forwards to page 75, please? <coughs> and look at um, um, under the heading question 3 adequate resilience um, 7.1 statement of the question the question is is the operation of the interface adequately resilient in terms of its ability to recover from um, failure states and then if we go down to 7.3.1.1, thank you. Um, description of the issue. Um, in order to pass a file to CAS VME, the CAP software uh, writes the file to a CAPS out tray and passes a file notification to CAS VME via expert. Certain problems in the use of expert have resulted in, and then there's a description. 
that when resolving such problems, it's proven very useful to be able to pass a file notification to CASVME manually. This has been done by using uh, CAS underscore MEND, which was provided informally by Anne Chambers ICL Systems, a member of the CASVME development team. It's anticipated that similar problems will be encountered in future and that the same SCL procedure or something very like it would um, prove equally useful. Now, there's no need for us to explore the technical details of what is um, being spoken about there, but is um, what is being uh, described the fact that you had yourself developed and provided a, a workaround utility? Yes. I think it was possibly something that we'd had for doing our own testing. Um, obviously, when you're testing things, you have to pretend that things are happening to some extent. And it turned out that it, it, you know, it, there was some sort of a requirement for this. That first paragraph is all <laughs> stuff that was very much in the benefits agency camp. Yes. If we can go over the page, please. To 77, sorry. Um, the report continues. Um, however, it was pointed out that the condition that gave rise to actions in which this utility was used was an error condition and not normal processing. Such an error condition should be investigated and understood. Uh, the current situation recovered and the root cause eliminated to prevent repetition. Therefore, occasion for the use of the utility should be very rare indeed. It was further pointed out that the use of the utility affects audit data for CAS VME. The CAS ICL is updated with information from a file notification specially created on the CAS side of the interface. That information is passed forward to the ICMF. It was queried whether, in principle, a utility of this nature should be provided by Pathway as a standard component of the CAS VME product, since it compromises the integrity of the audit trail and its use could, provide, could prove an embarrassment to Pathway in any contractual um, uh, dispute. A compromised position was formulated. It was recognised by Pathway and CAPS that the um, interface is not yet fully stable and that problems of the kind described may be encountered um, in the future. Such problems require that there should be a means of recovery. Is what uh, we're seeing described here um, evidence that fixes designed to address errors could themselves um, impact? I'll just stop. Start the question again. Is what we see here evidence that fixes designed to address errors could themselves impact on audit trails for the systems being developed? In, in theory, yes, they could. And you wouldn't be using something like this unless you absolutely had to. It shouldn't be a, a standard way of doing things if it then couldn't be audited or whatever. And why was that? Because this was a, sort of an ad hoc fix developed by you. It was. It wasn't developed as a fix. It was something that existed that we could use. Um, and I think it was initially for, for possibly for testing. I don't think it was called Casmend originally, but it was something so we could put an entry in a table to say, look, here's a file um, to get over this error condition, but that shouldn't ever have been a, a long-term fix to the problem. But sometimes if you had to choose between doing something like that that would then have to be documented as an unscheduled sort of a change, if, if you could either do that or a whole day's benefit, child benefit payments couldn't go through, then that's something that has to be weighed up against each other. Why would it compromise the integrity of the audit trail? Well, that's what it's suggesting here, isn't it? Yes, but why would it compromise the integrity of the audit trail? I cannot now remember enough about the details to say. Would the integrity of the audit trail be an important um, principle to maintain? Yes, it always is. Uh, why is that? Um, because then if there are 
questions afterwards about something, um, you need to be certain that you have got a, a proper record of, of what was done. You see that it mentions the report, um, the fix, um, compromising the integrity of the audit trail and its use could prove an embarrassment to pathway in any contractual dispute. Can you assist us to why the use of what I've described as the fix could prove an embarrassment to pathway in a contractual dispute? I, I cannot remember enough about all of this to be certain, but there was There was obviously a record kept of the, the files that have, had been received and the sizes and the dates and all that sort of stuff, which would have been, I presume, part of the audit trail. And I, I can't be certain now, but um, from what this is saying, it suggests that however we were notifying the system that there was an, an, another new file had come in but it, but the notification wasn't arriving in the, the normal way that can't have been recorded in the normal way i presume could you help us more broadly that document can come down thank you um did you hear any um word amongst your colleagues or chatter or, or, or similar about how the pathway project had gone for Fujitsu by the time you joined ESSC in October 2000? Um, what was the no, word on the street? I, 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 uh, I knew that uh, at, at that point the rollout was going ahead. I think when I started there were about 25% of post office branches had got the new horizon system um, and so obviously it was ramping up very rapidly and I certainly I, I, I can't remember I, I don't recall anybody saying it was so dreadful that enough to make me feel I did not want to be a part of it um, what so about I've, something less than that were you told um, for example, when you were joining the SSE or beforehand, that a range of problems and issues have been encountered in the design, um, build and rollout of Horizon? No, I mean, you would expect there to be a certain level of problems and they obviously, they needed more people in SSE. There was quite a lot of recruitment going on, which by the nature, you know, that is a a group of people who are providing support so there was obviously a need to have that group and to, to build it up but I didn't feel I wasn't aware of anything you know oh this is so bad we've got to have so many extra people on it it was you know this is an exciting new project it's at last after many years of preparation it's it's up and running you know great let's keep it going and and, and make sure it's all you know working well and doing its job were you told that the benefits agency had pulled out because of concerns over the integrity of the data that Horizon produced? No. When you joined the SSE, did you therefore think you were to be providing support for uh, a good and properly functioning system? I anticipated that it would have problems, otherwise there would have been no job for me to do there. Yes, that doesn't really answer the question, Mrs Chambers. No, I, I, I don't think anybody in, who's doing computer support work ever sort of... You know, the, the whole purpose of our existence was to get on top of any problems that there were. And I mean, it, this is probably going to come out wrong, but in, in some ways, the, the whole, not exactly enjoyment of the job, but what you're there for is to sort out these problems. So you, you do anticipate that, yes, there, there will be things to, to get your teeth into, if you like. But were you approaching this, that this was just another project in um, a line 
and that there was nothing, you weren't walking into a project that had had a particularly problematic birth. No, that was not how I, I saw it. I, I was, I mean, for me personally, I was ready for a change, and it was quite a big change, because at that point I went back on site, so I hadn't actually had to work with other people very much for 15 years. Um, and I was moving from being very technical, doing a fourth-line support job, to, to being less technical. I was also moving away from supporting things on VME, which was the, my main technical speciality, to something that was using... The, well, it wasn't VME-based at all, apart from this one file that was left. So you joined the SSC. Um, what did you understand SSC to, to stand for? Uh, We've had three variants of this. Uh, yeah, I th System Support Centre. Thank you. Uh, you joined in October 2000. Yes. And you stayed there for the rest of um, your career with Fujitsu. Yes. Uh, what was your job title when you um, first joined the SSE in October 2000? I think it was system specialist, but I cannot be entirely sure. Um, job titles did change here and there. They didn't necessarily... It's, uh, they, they were usually sort of fairly vague, but I think I was a system specialist. And were you now working full-time when you moved yes, to the SSE? Yes, I had been... I think I'd been working 30 hours plus quite a lot extra from home and so now I was officially 37 hours a week. And did you um, uh, now work in the office? Yes I did. And was that in Bracknell? Yes it was. And when you joined the SSC who was your um, manager or supervisor? Mick Peach. So he didn't remain your manager for the entirety of the 16 years that you worked in the SSC that's right isn't it? That's right yes. Uh, but when he worked there, to whom did he report? I can't remember. It was different people at different times. Um, did he report to a director? I don't... Th oh. I don't think so, no. I think there was several layers, but I... Again, I... My, my interests were, were technical and not particularly in the, the structure of the organisation. Did you ever um, report to the person above Mick Peach or did you always report into Mick Peach? I always reported into Mick or his successors. After um, Mick Peach left, um, you say in your statement in a, um, about 2010, just with a transcript, Mr Peach says it was in September 2009, um, you say that he was replaced by Tony Little for a few months. That's the name I think I remember. And then by Steve Parker? Yes. Uh, did Steve Parker remain um, your um, manager until you left in 2016? Yes, he did, although we had team leaders as well, so we did have an extra layer. And those team leaders, were they introduced by Mr Parker? Uh, yes, from the existing team. And were there four teams? I think there were four. I can't be quite certain. Can you remember what the division within the teams was? <laughs> uh, or between the teams? They were just sort of purely for administration. It wasn't, for, it wasn't sort of one team supporting one particular area or anything so like that. There wasn't specialism no. team A, specialism no. team B? No. Except possibly... I, At some point, the reference data team sort of merged into SSC, and I can't remember now if they stayed as more or less a separate team or if they ended up reporting to different team leaders. So there was a, a mixed economy of skills within yeah. your team, yeah. even though, as we're going to discover in a moment, you specialised? Yes. So going back to the beginning then, in October 2000, there was essentially a flat structure with one manager, Mick Beach? Yes. And how many people worked in the SSC at that time when you joined? I think it was around 25, but I can't be certain of that. And were they all what I'm going to call diagnosticians? 
Yes, I think that's <laughs> true to say. And there was an administrator as well on top, is that right? Uh, yes, there was an administrator and then at one point an administrator's assistant as well and then no administrator. <laughs> uh, what was the function of the administrator? Um, order the stationery, answer the door because it was a secure unit so people had to be let in, uh, answer the phone and monitor the stack of service tickets, peak calls coming in and allocating them to members of the team. So they had a role in allocation of the pinnacles and then the peaks? They allocated them, yes, and also she'd look at any kells that had been mentioned to see if it looked at a fairly superficial level, if it, it looked as if it was the right one. If there was absolutely no information on the call, giving any clue as to what the problem really was, then she might return the call to second line and ask them to get some more information. And was that person the same throughout this period? Was it uh, Bar Barbara Longley? It was Barbara Longley until she retired and I cannot quite recall when that was. Um, I think it must have been before 2008, I think, or 2009. How did she determine to whom to allocate a pinnacle or peak? Um, partly what sort of area it was. Um, somebody who hadn't got any calls on their stack already. Obviously, it would be a primate workload. Interest. Um, sometimes somebody, because we could all see the, this stack of calls, sometimes somebody would say, oh, I'd, I'd like that one, or... <laughs> Or, or somebody who, you know, might point out to her that it was relevant to something else that had already come in. Were there specialisms within um, the 25 of you? Yes, we all, everybody seemed to, to gravitate to, to different areas. And was that it, um, the, the force of gravity, i.e. personal interest, or was it anything more formal um, than that? It was... So it's partly what people's backgrounds were when, when they came in. Um, if Mick felt that there was a bit of a gap somewhere and not enough people specialising in one particular area, he'd, he'd obviously get somebody in and say, right, you know, you're doing this. It's right, though, that you were each expected to handle any type of yeah. uh, ticket, yes. um, if necessary. Yes, we were. I think the number of 25 decreased over time, is that right? You tell us in your statement that by the time you left in 2016, the number had decreased to between 12 and 15 people. I think so. It's, it's really hard to remember it, definite numbers, especially because towards the end of that time, partly we were taking on some extra bits of workload, non-pathway stuff. Um, some other teams that had been elsewhere in, path, uh, elsewhere in Pathway were now either part of SSC or at least sharing the same floor space as us. So it's a little difficult to remember who was where and, and which team. I'd also say that I think the numbers reduced a bit before HNGX and then I think we got more people on board then when the new system was rolled out everywhere in 2010. So it decreased before Horizon Online? I think it, it had dropped a, a little bit naturally just by you know, people leaving and not so many new people coming in. You tell us in your statement that you were most likely to deal with tickets um, that concerned counterbalancing. Yes. Um, how did that come about? Uh, I think largely because I was sitting next to somebody who was an expert in that area and although she hadn't been my sort of official mentor when I started I picked up on a lot of the stuff that she was doing and also I liked the you know, playing around with numbers and checking that things added up. You say that there were five or six of you when there were 25 that would be most likely to handle tickets that concerned counterbalancing, is that right? Probably, yes. I mean, more of us would have... There, there were certainly 
a lot of other people who might occasionally have picked up a, a call of that type, but probably the, the more complicated problems would come down to you know, five or four, five or six of us. Can you remember who they were? Um, yes, I mean, Diane Rowe early on, um, Dave Seddon and Lena Kiang, who were both there for longer than I was. Um, Sue Dipser, who started at about the same time as me. Uh, Cheryl Card, who started later. Um, and then people like John Simpkins and Mark Wright, who knew a great deal about everything, um, wouldn't may be doing those sort of calls so often, but they had a very good knowledge of the entire system. And I apologise to anybody I've left out of this. Did your role in counterbalancing mean that you became a specialist in um, the operation of Repost and the EPOS system? Well, we all needed to know a lot about Repost anyway, because it was at the heart of the entire system. Um, but yes, the, the EPOS system, I would really perhaps... In where I've talked about counterbalancing, um, I mean, a lot of the problems were more general. EPOS, counter front end part of the system. You've told us that um, this specialism developed because of the person that you were sitting next to. Mm -hmm. um, can I just explore with you um, what, if any, training you had on and about the Horizon system before you became responsible for investigating problems and issues with it? and the integrity of the data that it produced. Um, you, you tell us in your witness statement that in 2000, you and some other new joiners attended the same counter-training that was provided for sub-postmasters, is that right? Yes, that's right. And how long did that counter-training um, last? Um, I think it was probably a week session, and it was, of course, run specially for us, just in a, a room on our secure floor. Uh, was the training, to your knowledge, in any way changed because you were the system diagnosticians or were you treated as if you were sub-postmasters? I think we were treated as sub-postmasters because it's useful to see it you know, from the end user's point of view, <coughs> although obviously we didn't have the business knowledge that any postmaster who had been running his branch using the, the paper systems for years, they, they would come in with, with that sort of knowledge. In the course of that training, were you told about um, concerns, issues or defects in the Horizon system? I don't recall being told of any during that training. Now, the counter software used for balancing was main, maintained by the EPOS system within development, the fourth line support, is that right? Yes. Did you know at this time, on joining or shortly thereafter, any um, internal reputation within Fujitsu of um, uh, EPOS during the development of Horizon that it was, had been rather problematic or troublesome? I don't recall that, no. So again, you were thinking you were um, operating a system that was well-oiled and functioning, but may turn up problems because otherwise you wouldn't have a job. Yes, I think that's true. Can we look please at um, WITN 04600104? This is um, an ICL pathway report dated um, the 10th of May 2000. You can see that on the top right. So a few months before you took up your post, yes? Yes. Um, it concerns the results of an audit. You'll see that it's um, titled both at the top and in its first line, Schedule of Corrective Actions, um, CSR plus development um, audit. Now, if we scroll down, we can see that um, you're not on the distribution list, and I'm not suggesting that this was um, shown to you in, in any way. Can we go to page nine of the, the document, please?
And can we look, please, at the... Um, first column in the table, uh, the audit identified that EPOS continues to be unstable. A pinnacle evidence illustrated the numbers of pinnacles raised since the 1998 task force and the rate of their being raised. The EPOS solutions report made specific recommendations to consider the redesign and rewrite of EPOS in part or in whole to address the then known shortcomings. In light of the continued evidence of poor product quality, these recommendations um, should be uh, reconsidered. Did you know when you joined the SSE that an audit of the EPOS had found it to be unstable? No. Did you know that a report had concluded that EPOS should be redesigned and rewritten? No. Nope. Uh, did you know that in May 2000, a few months before you joined, that that recommendation had been repeated? No. Nope. Can we go to page 10 of the document, please? and look at the response. It's in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, thank you. Following response received from MJBC. As discussed, this should be closed. Effectively, as a management team, we have accepted the ongoing cost of maintenance rather than the cost of a rewrite. Rewrites of the product will only be considered if we need to reopen the code to introduce significant changes in functionality. We will continue to monitor the code quality based on product defects as we progress through the final passes of testing and the introduction of the mod modified CI4 code set into live usage and the network. PJ can make sure this is specifically covered in our reviews of the B and TC test cycles closed. Did you know when you joined that the quality of the EPOS code based on, um, as they're described, product defects was supposed to remain under review during the introduction of the modified code set into live usage in the network? Um, no. You were part of the SSC in the months um, following this um, report. Um, to your knowledge, was, um, were people, including you, in the SSC told of the need to monitor the EPOS code through product defects? I don't recall being told that, and it's perhaps something that I would have expected our manager to have been keeping an eye on, rather than, I mean, because he knew all the problems that were coming in, rather than those of us certainly people who've only just started, who will just be looking at, at individual incidents as they happen. Do, is that in fact the case, that he would look at every ticket and see the outcome of it? I cannot speak for him, but I think it's, uh, he certainly had the ability to do that. The, the, the ability, yes, but um, to your knowledge, in the 16 years that you worked there, did the manager perform that kind of function? There's a recommendation here that this um, uh, action be closed, that there be no rewrite, no redesign of EPOS, because there's going to be a monitoring process. Yes, but I wouldn't expect something like that to be monitored by the, the, the people, if you like, at the very bottom of the heap. I would have expected somebody slightly higher up, for example, the SSC manager, but I obviously cannot say yes or no, he did this. And I think it, knowing Mick, it's quite likely that he did. Um, but it might have been him, it might have been somebody else. On if you didn't know about this, um, you wouldn't know to feed back. I'm noticing a preponderance of problems with the EPOS um, system or the code in this part of the EPOS system, would you? 
No, I wouldn't. But then, I, as I said, I, I would have expected that to have been monitored at a slightly higher level. Would you expect the people at the lower level, as you've called it, including yourself, to have contributed to that, i.e. Um, a monthly review or a quarterly review or even a yearly review? Let's look at how EPOS is performing. Um, I don't know. I mean... No, I, I still feel that that's the sort of thing that, you know, where you've got a lot of people working, not exactly individually, but uh, when the information is all there on the peaks and so on, I would have, ex I think it seems much more likely and sens sensible in some ways for it to be um, looked at by somebody who's got the technical knowledge, but has, you know, their job is to take the, the broader view. But there wasn't any formal instruction to you or informal instruction to you to say, chalk up when you're dealing with a ticket, a problem with um, EPOS no. so that it can be fed back to somebody conducting uh, an overarching review to carry this recommendation into effect. No, we were never told to do that. When you joined the um, SSC... What was the role of um, uh, Gareth Jenkins? I was aware that he was uh, one of the technical experts. Um, I think to start with, he was... I'm not sure if he was based in Felton then, where a lot of the development teams were, um, but I don't think I met him for until I've been there for two or three or four years. So 2003, 2004? Possibly. It might have been slightly sooner. I think I became aware of the name because you saw it on, on documents and, and so on. But um, SSC were very much self-contained on our floor because it was a skill floor, so you didn't have people coming and going. So we sort of, did, to did quite a large extent, kept ourselves to ourselves. Did you understand him to be the principal Fujitsu expert on the counter-application? I probably picked that up at fairly quickly, yes. I don't think anybody ever told me that. Was there any process of induction to say, for example, um, this is Mr Jenkins, he's the chief designer architect of, I don't know, the changes to Poles back-end systems, that meant he works a lot with the counter-application and the EPOS code. No, um, I don't If you have X problem, he's your point of contact. No, and he wouldn't at that point necessarily have been our next point of contact because we'd probably have talked to the... EPOS developers about any problems in the first instance and then I'd have expected uh, them to go and talk to Gareth if necessary. And by the EPOS developers, do you mean people in-house? Yeah. yeah. Um, what, uh, did you form any um, opinion of the quality of the EPOS development developers? Um, I'm trying to think who was there. They, yes, I, I, I didn't work closely with them. As I said, they, to start with, they were in, in Felton anyway. Um, I think there's, there's always a, a slight tension between support and developers who are also doing support because they are often actually developing enhancements to the system and so on. And so sometimes perhaps you felt you wanted them to focus a little bit more on the support of an ex existing problem, but they were heads down working on, on something new. In the months after you joined, did you form a view on the quality of the product, the EPOS, that they were working with? Um, 
I don't think I thought of it in those terms at, at that point. You know, this, this was what we were looking after. We dealt with whatever came up and where necessary, we, we passed things on to EPOS. Um, I can't remember in those very early days when things were still potentially settling down after the, the rollout. Um, the only thing that I can remember is that there were, I can remember one call in particular to do with a cash account production where it was very difficult to sort of get to the bottom of the problem and to work out what the numbers on the, the cash account should actually have been and so on. Um, and I think there was someone called Steve Warwick who I think was involved um, in, in trying to, to help out with that. So I, I remember that as just one particular call where there was a particular problem and difficulty and I cannot remember what the, the root cause of it was. But you didn't have a, an overarching view of EPOS that it was a problematic or troublesome system. The inquiries heard some evidence um, already in f its phase two as to the views of um, some of those within Fujitsu and post office mm -hmm. as to the quality of the EPOS system. One describing it as a bag of and then an expletive. Um, when yeah. you took over um, in the SSC, it didn't strike you as being uh, deeply problematic? No. I mean, by this time, there were, I don't know, perhaps initially 10,000 post office counters using it every day for all their business, and then 15,000, and then 25,000, and finally about 37,000 counters using it and although yes obviously some calls were coming in and some of them were EPOS we certainly weren't being swamped with the number of calls that you would expect if the system was was thoroughly rotten because it just you know once you've ramped up to those volumes you are going to if, if there are problems you are going to be seeing them. Assuming they made it to the third line support Yes, but basically, it, you know, the, this did seem to be a usable system because it was being used. You, you mean because it didn't fall over? It didn't fall over. Uh, people weren't reporting, oh, I pressed this button to sell a first-class stamp and it's sold a, I don't know, something else instead. <laughs> Um, we weren't getting large numbers of calls, people saying, oh, we did this and it's, it's not there and so on. Um, so I think it's, you know, it, it's hard to put it into words, but we weren't getting, if you like, the feedback from the live estate that, it, 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 that there were a huge number of significant problems. And so these um, fears that have been expressed just months before you joined, that there needed to be a total redesign and total rewrite of EPOS, um, um, it, when the system was working, they just yeah. didn't come to pass? Well, it may well be. That's, I mean, I don't know, you, you gave the date on the front of this as being... 10th, 10th of May. Yes, but was that, that was the final edition of that document rather than when it was initially written. Correct. So it's quite possible that bug fixes and other changes would have been made to the system in that period. So, you know, the, the system wasn't static. Uh, things were being fixed and enhanced all the way through its life. The, the inquiry understands that document. You can come down. Thank you that um, a gentleman called Matt Aris, A-R-I-S, was the EPOS uh, development team leader. Do, do you remember that? I remember the name. Do, do you remember him being the development team leader? I couldn't have sworn to that if you hadn't just told me. Can you help us? What would be his, if he was the development team leader, his relationship to Gareth Jenkins? Um, I assume that if there was 
when changes to the system were happening, changes to the code were happening or to the design, um, he would use Gareth to discuss anything that needed discussing and so on. So he was more senior to um, Mr Jenkins? No, Mr Jenkins would have been more senior, I would have thought. Were they in the same team, the same reporting structure? I've no idea. Did you have dealings with Mr Harris? I almost certainly talked to him. I, I, I think I did talk to him. I mean, to, to start with, I, as I said, we were quite a, a self-contained team. And if we wanted to pass a, a, a ticket on to fourth line because we thought there was a code problem and they needed to investigate further, then the way of doing that was just to assign it um, on peak so it got passed through. As time went by, I've always liked to try and develop some sort of relationship between teams. And so certainly once the, the development teams had moved into Bracknell, then I would quite likely walk down a flight of stairs and go and talk to them about something rather than just sort of saying, oh, well, it's off my desk and, and passing it on to them in that way. Can I turn, um, before we have the morning break, to um, uh, the ways in which the SSE operated in practice? And I've got 10 or so issues that I want to ask you about, please. Firstly, the data available to you. Um, secondly, the process by which tickets were passed to the SSC and in particular the system for linking them to a KEL. Um, thirdly, concerns about the SSC fobbing off sub-postmasters. Fourthly, how the SSC would go about establishing the extent of a problem when it received a ticket. Fifthly, what information was passed back to sub-postmasters by the SSC or others. Um, six, some other problems with the peak system. Um, seven, um, the process of um, basing an investigation around a single peak. Eighth, looking at the Horizon Help Desk role. Ninth, um, the use of ARQ data. And tenth, um, attributing a problem to user error. Okay, so they're the, the ten topics that we're going to look at. Firstly, then, um, the data available to you when a ticket um, uh, was allocated to you. Um, you tell us in paragraph 30 of your witness statement. Maybe if we can um, turn that up, please. Witness statement, paragraph 30. Which is on page 8. You tell us um, in the last sentence of um, the, the main part of paragraph 30, in relation to counter issues for legacy horizon, the primary sources of evidence would be, and then you set out three bullet points. So fir the first one, is, is that the branch data in the message store? Yes, this is all the branch transaction data and various other messages that would be written to the message store as well and all the reference data for the branch. And just now for later on when I ask you questions, it's right, is it, that that data could later be retrieved from an archive via Fujitsu security and is referred to as the ARQ data? Yes. Yes, is that a, a um, shorthand summary? <laughs> yes, I mean, the, the ARQ data could either contain the, the whole of the message store or, well, it was a, a slightly, <laughs> I don't know how I can explain this without explaining a bit more about message stores and repost, but you may not want to go into that now. Um, I probably don't, thank you. Okay. But um, for present purposes, it's sufficient to note that this, bullet, this first bullet point contained data that was archived that data was all archived, yes. Um, Fujitsu security could um, access it, and a, a way of describing it is ARQ Good. data. Yes. Okay. And then secondly, um, the event log from the Horizon counter-application. Yeah. 
Um, and then thirdly, the... Um, yeah, sorry, could I go back to the second one? That's actually the, the Windows NT application event log. So it's not just the Horizon application that's writing to it. Okay, can you just describe, um, uh, for the benefit of those listening, what the Windows NT log was then? Any events that have been generated by an application running on a computer or by the Windows <laughs> system itself would so, be written to this event log. So essentially events in the Windows product that... Um, the counter application was built on top of. Yes, but also counter application events as well would be in there. But it's it's not purely counter application events. There would be events from other processes running on the counter as well. And then thirdly, the PS standard dot log from the counter. Can you explain what that is, please? Um, that was a, I think a sort of, I think PS stood for peripheral server, but it. it got written to by various things so in that we, we could see thing, stuff like what had been output on the tally roll printer at the branch and so on there were also a, a certain level of diagnostics came out somewhere and I can't remember if they were also in the PS standard log or if I've missed something and they went somewhere else so the two event logs that you mentioned in the um, second and third bullet points there, um, on which servers were they stored? They weren't stored on servers. They were only stored on the counter. They weren't stored on servers at all? The logs, the, the, the events were sent to the data centre through something called Tivoli, mm -hmm. I think, and then they were stored. And where were those um, servers? Uh, at the data centre, one in Bootle and one in Wigan. But I couldn't tell you the names of the particular servers that these were stored on. Were there backup arrangements for those servers? Almost certainly, but I don't know any of the detail. You can't help us with what those backup arrangements might have been? No. And I don't think that the, the, the stream of events, although it was there for monitoring, and in fact they, they were saved for posterity, they weren't sort of securely <laughs> locked and audited in the way that the message stored data that could then be retrieved via an ARQ request was, was locked and Kept. That, that was my next question. What processes were employed to ensure that the um, data on those two event logs was archived and maintained securely? I don't think it particularly was. You said in an answer before last that they were just kept for posterity. Um, mm. By that, did you mean... Um, by accident, as it were, uh, yeah. rather than by design, because I th uh, I think the, the it, archive data might be needed. Yes, I think it was more that a, a, a lot of files were kept um, for, for quite a, a period, but data that was intended for future use in prosecutions and so on, if you like, um, was... That was very carefully secured and and then there were sort of proper ways of accessing it and so on but that that um, process wasn't extended to the data um, archived in relation to these two event logs have I understood you correctly the application event log no and the PS standard logs they didn't go anywhere except they, they were just on the counter so we could retrieve them and they were only there for a, quite a short period of time. And so when um, you and the SSE retrieved data from um, event logs and including from the archive, how was that process recorded? I don't think it was. Um, we wouldn't... The, the long-term event archive 
um, was very rarely used. We didn't, I didn't know it was there until 2006. Um, the, the stream that went through Tivoli, we could look at, and I cannot remember if that had anything behind it that did secure that for any length of time. Um, if we pulled an application event log direct from the counter or the PS standard log direct from the counter, I'm not sure that that was recorded anywhere that we had done that. Was nothing done to ensure that the retrieval of data from these two sources was um, recorded and was undertaken in a secure, auditable way? I don't think it was, no. It was the only, the security about it was that we were in a, a locked floor um, with fairly restricted access to, to the, the counters. Um, On the counter application, what sort of events would be recorded? Um, the one that springs to my mind is if um, repost outputs, the repost being not part of the counter application but underlying it, um, if that produced an error, or even just you'd also have startup messages in there. So as the counter application started up, it would write various. Um, events saying where it had got to in the process. Who, who programmed the counter application to record which events? I presume it was in the development code, but I've no idea. Do you know um, the decision making that had been applied into which events were recorded and which were not? No. These are not, there's a big opportunity for misunderstanding here. Um, the counter application itself wrote events into the message store to say when somebody logged on and logged off or when they did a declaration or when they produced a report, those sort of events. But those are repost events stored in, sorry, not repost events. Um, well, they're, they're events that are stored in the message store rather than in the application event log. On the NT event log? The um, NT event log. Um, w that was presumably a result of Microsoft programming? No, the counter application... If, <sighs> yes, I, I, I don't think I remember well enough and I... To, under, to explain this, with, if I had an example in front of me, I could probably work through it and, and explain things to you, but trying to remember it cold, I don't think I'm going to be able to add a lot more here. If you um, investigated the event logs whilst dealing with the ticket, would you preserve the event logs with the ticket, i.e. with the peak, um, or alternatively in the KEL, or not preserve them at all? If the ticket needed further investigation and was going on to fourth line, then yes, the event log would be attached to the peak along with the message store and anything else we'd found that, that looked useful because the SSC were the only team who could get this information out of the live system, so we were expected to get what we could because then that was all that fourth line support would be able to look at to try and find the root cause and so on. Um, if our investigation didn't find anything further that was needed, for example, it was another instance of a known error or something else, then these probably wouldn't be saved. And if they weren't um, preserved in the way you've just described, um, how long was each species of event log um, retained for? That would be up to the individual. I would probably keep everything I'd looked at for at least a year, if not longer, just in case there was any follow-up. 
but that was a matter of individual discretion yeah, think, amongst the 25 of you. Yes. And where would you keep it? Um, on our secure server. So what would you do? Would you save it as a file? And Yes, it would be saved. When we extracted it, it would go into somewhere in our own area. Uh, so we you almost save it to desktop? User, not on our desktop, no, no on a, a, a remote server but, that I, we had access to. And um, why did you settle on a year to keep? Um, sometimes it would be longer than it. If I felt I was starting to run out of space, I would... Because I, I would very occasionally do a tidy up, but I wasn't the tidiest person in the world. But it was down to your individual discretion? I believe so, yes. I don't think anybody ever said, oh, you must keep this. For, I'm sure nobody ever said. Um, in addition to the data that we've um, just looked at, when a ticket was assigned to you, if appropriate, you would have had a, a kel, yes? Um... If somebody who had already looked at it at first or second line or potentially the pre-scanner had decided that a kel, a, an existing kel looked, looked applicable, yeah. then yes, they would have put a mention to that on the, the peak or the power help call and then it was just a hot link to, to click on it and to, to read the detail. And if they hadn't made that association, would you nonetheless check the kel system to see whether there was one? Probably, yes. That was, that was probably the process. In, in practice, once I had been there for some length of time, if it was a call, an incident coming in about something that I was already familiar with, I, um, you know, I, I might well know without searching which Kel it was. But yes, certainly if something came in, somebody reporting a particular error message, then you will do a Kel search for that error message or whatever, and if you found something, then that's your, your starting point. And how would you do a Kel search? Um, was it a, a free text It was a free, keyword a very, very free text search. So you, you just entered a few words that you thought might be relevant. Obviously, if you've got an error number or something like that, that's a good starting position. Or an event from a particular source, there would be clues in that as well so you could type any or all of these things in and see what you got and how um, accurate and reliable was that process in turning up relevant kels um, pretty good but like any system it depends you know, how well they've been written in the first place um, but certainly for something like a specific error number um, yes if there was a kel you, you were very likely to, to find it. And then lastly, before the break, um, you also had the databases of past pinnacles and peaks, is that right, <laughs> that you could access? Yes, again, that was a, a free text sort of a search, I think. I was about to ask, how would you search the database of pinnacles and peaks? Yeah, I'm trying to think back. Um... Certainly by the time I left, I'm just about certain it was, was very easy to search. Um, again, a free text search. Would you habitually do that if a ticket came in? Would you go to the Pinnacle and Peak <coughs> database and um, look at that database to investigate the current ticket? I'd be more likely to do it from the Kell system. Um, and so only if there was a link to past peaks um, or pinnacles in the kel would you click the hyperlink through, is that right? Yes, probably that would be the normal way of, of, of doing it. Yes, thank you very much. Um, is, I wonder if that's an, uh, yeah. an appropriate moment. Just in relation to um, the noises, the first noise was a waste disposal unit's pistons <laughs> um, needing oiling. Um, <laughs> Uh, that has been done. Um, the second noise was a mobile phone. Um, that won't happen again, I'm sure. Um, the third noise was a fire alarm, not in this building, because we wouldn't be here. It was of um, an adjacent building behind us, which had to be evacuated, but not us. Well, such was my concentration level, Mr Beer, but I didn't hear the third noise. So, so whatever was going on between you and the witness kept it out. Anyway, we'll have a 15-minute break. Um,
Mrs. Chambers, I don't expect you to um, keep yourself in perder when we have these breaks, but just don't talk about your evidence with anyone, all right? Thank you. Yes, Mr. Beer. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mrs. Chambers, you said um, before the break that when um, a ticket would come in, you would um, principally rely on any pinnacles or peaks that were referenced in a CAL to conduct your investigation. No, you asked me if I would search through the peaks. Yes. I said probably not, so you had links from a CAL. Yes. Um, that was, wouldn't be how you'd start an investigation. No, though. I wasn't saying that was the entire range of the data that you would look at. We yeah. looked at the data that you would um, use yeah. before the break. But insofar as you were to look for pinnacles and peaks, you would rely on those that were referenced in the KEL. That would be your... your your starting point if you wanted, if you needed to look at another peak to do And so say there were two that were referenced and they were hyperlinked there, would you think, right, that's it? Or would you, on each and every occasion, look at um, the Pinnacle and Peak database to see whether there are any more? Um, no, you... you It would depend so much on the individual problem. What factors would um, determine whether you would or would not rely on pinnacles and peaks identified in a CAL? Sorry, I'm not thinking this through very well. Um, when you're investigating a, a problem that's come in, um, you, you're not necessarily starting by seeing how many times it's already happened or whatever. That might then be something that you would do later on in the investigation. But you, so, so you're saying if it's a known error, a definite known error that has come in, would I then go and look to see how many other occurrences of it there had been? Yes, I'm not saying that. I'm asking what, yeah. what your practice yeah. was. I mean, if it's a known error and there is a kale for it already, then it is possible that that should not have come over to third line in any case. But we're necessarily talking here about cases where um, there is a kale associated with um, the ticket that you're... There is a kale associated yeah. with the ticket, but the call has been passed over to us anyway, so yeah. then we need to look at the circumstances of this individual call and and see whether the KEL does relate to it. Um, you, know, you, you do a lot of investigation mm -hmm. before you go following all the other links. Yes, and I wasn't looking at the issue of where do you start. I was looking mm -hmm. at the entirety of your investigation. And in the entirety of that investigation, the question is to what extent do you rely on only those peaks and pinnacles identified in the KEL as being associated with this issue? Mm -hmm. Or do you look at the pinnacle and peak database to look for other pinnacles and peaks that may be associated with this issue? Yes. In some cases, you would. And what would determine, for some cases, that you would and those that you wouldn't? If it looked like it was a repeating problem that wasn't where you needed to get some idea of, of how often it was happening, then, then yes, you would go and look at all the, the peaks and pinnacles. How would you know whether it was a repeating problem without looking at the pinnacles and peaks? Because of our knowledge of the system and the things that we had individually looked at before and whether the KEL said this has happened here, here and here and what the implications of the, the problem were. I mean, in some cases, you would... 
Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm finding this rather hard to answer sensibly because it's not, you know, if you gave me... It, 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 So if we're, you're saying a new problem has been, well, an existing problem is there, we have another call about an existing problem, would I always go and see how many instances it, there had been? Um, it would depend what, whether it was something that each instance could be dealt with sensibly, individually, or whether we felt it was part of a, you know, a, there, there was a bigger picture that needed to be identified. Okay, I'll move on, but I'll come back to that later. You say in your witness statement, it's paragraph 16, if we just look at it on um, page four. Well done, thank you very much. I'm asked um, whether I consider that the KEL system was adequate for its purpose. Overall, I think the KEL system worked well, although there were some problems. For example, many KELs documented similar symptoms and service tickets could be passed to the SSC with the wrong KEL quoted. Yes? Yeah. Um, when you say the wrong Kel quoted, it meant that somebody in the chain before you had identified a Kel that um, was unrelated to or irrelevant to this problem. Is that right? Yes. Or it might have looked similar on the surface, but they were unable to... They hadn't realised it, it didn't apply, and there might have been a, a better Kel which they hadn't found. Was that um, raised as an issue of concern within Fujitsu by the SSC? No, I don't think so. It was up to SSC to improve the KELs so that the right one was found in future. Uh, we, we were the ones who were writing the KELs. But you weren't the one that was doing the associations on a new ticket that was sent to you, were you? No, no. But if they had, if second line, first line had found the wrong Kel, then you know we would look at the kels to see how it could be made clearer in future, so they would were more likely to pick up the correct one. That was part of our job. Was anything therefore done to rectify this problem with the kel system? Well, it wasn't a problem with the kel system; it was a problem with the individual, the ways the, some of the individual kels were written. If there wasn't enough information in them for somebody to ascertain between problem A and problem B. That's one way of looking at it. It's the way that the KEL has been written by the SSC. Mm. Another way is that the people doing the assigning in um, uh, phase one and phase two, um, first and second line, are just um, misassociating KELs with the new ticket. Yes, they. Yes, so it is a problem that they have have done that, and yeah. And uh, was that raised with first and second line support? I'm sure occasionally it was passed back to them that they hadn't found the, the right one, but um, I don't think it was such a huge... Uh, yes, I don't, don't think it was a huge problem. How was it established that um, the wrong Kel had been uh, quoted on the ticket? Because when I or one of my colleagues looked at the information and the problem, um, we could see that it, it, it wasn't the, the right one and that there was a better one. I mean, we, we wouldn't have started our investigation only by looking at the kill that had been pointed out to us. We would have looked at all the evidence available if you had um, picked up a ticket that had the wrong Kel associated with it mm -hmm. would you go back yourself to the person in first or second line support who had made that association and say look you've um, 
associated the wrong hell here? Probably not. What was the system, therefore, to ensure that first and second line support <laughs> did not make these mistakes? For me to rewrite the KELs as necessary, so to clarify between the two problems. You're again focusing on saying that it's your fault or the yes, SSC's yes, fault was, rather than people in the first and second line um, making mistakes. Largely, yes. You, I mean, people do make mistakes. You have to base your systems around the fact that people don't always get it right first time. Was there any um, system of reporting to your manager um, where you would log wrong Kel associated with this ticket and he would um, collect that data up on a monthly, quarterly, yearly basis and then go back to first and second line support? I, I don't know. I mean, we might well put a comment on the peak saying it's not this Kel, it's that one. Whether anybody monitored for that and fed it back, I don't know. If there wasn't anything in the KEL or the um, peaks or pinnacles to help you, uh, did you have any tools for analysing um, for the branch concerned um, a week or a month's worth of data? Or did you need the sub-postmaster to narrow the period of the relevant problem down to a reasonably short period of time so you could look at that data line by line? It obviously helped if the postmaster was aware, uh, you know, had some idea of which day or what sort of... Um, I mean, it, uh, are we talking now about balancing problems yes. where there's a discrepancy? Yes. Because this was only a, a, a very small proportion of the calls that we were dealing with. Um, so maybe I've been misunderstanding you because I've been answering in general terms, whereas maybe you've just been intending to ask me about specific balancing problems. Previously I was asking in general terms about the system of um, linking KELs to yeah. peaks and pinnacles. Now I'm asking about um, A specific balancing, balancing problem. Um, the more information that the postmaster could provide, uh, the more, the easier it was obviously for us to focus and look at a particular area of, of concern. Um, and sometimes, I mean, we'll see examples of this, problems with REM in and REM outs, they were, were very, they realised very quickly that something had gone wrong while they were doing that. And so then obviously, we'd always pull back the complete message store, which contained roughly a month's transactions that varied at different times but we're talking about a month's transactions and, and just to stop you there was that the typical period that you personally would seek data for that is what was in a counter message store when you retrieved it from the correspondence server because the data was retained for I think initially 42 <laughs> days and then it dropped down to about 35 days and so the, the message store that we got back for a branch would always contain all that data. We would then focus in on any specific areas of, of problems, but if necessary, we could look at, over that entire period. If a sub-postmaster said that they had misbalanced, but they couldn't point out where in the week that had occurred or where in the month later on that had occurred... Would you ever refer them back to the MBSC? I would always have a look to see if I could narrow it down to where a problem might have occurred. And I would, I mean, I could go into some detail as to how I would do that if you want me to. Um, at the moment, w would you ever refer them back to the MBSC to provide more detail? If the MBSC were meant to have taken them through some f to question them fairly strongly to see if there were any user errors that might have caused this, if we got a call, this type of call and there was no sign that it had already been through NBSC, then it might well be passed back. But we would normally expect the... the first or second line to have said hang on you need to go and talk to MBSC first so by the time it came through to us I, I would almost always I, 
I would have a look anyway, um, just to see what I could see. Did you have a, um, a methodical process that you applied um, to each ticket in terms of steps of investigation that replicated itself time and time again, or was it dependent on the nature of the issue identified in the ticket? It would depend very much on the, the nature of the, the issue, um, but you know, getting the message store was always one of the first things for anything counter-related. And what did you do when you obtained the message store? You, I think this is what you were going to tell me a moment ago. Yeah, you opened it up and it's this absolutely enormous text file, so we used a fairly good text editor that would let us highlight, search things, highlight lines, pull out all the lines that we'd marked. Um, so for a, a discrepancy call where we weren't given any other clues, um, I would highlight all the product one lines, product one being cash, pull them out, put them into a spreadsheet, which are developed a bit, that then... In, so instead of a, just a very long, very hard to read text line, it would pull out fields of interest, which obviously would be value, the, the mode in which this transaction had been done. Um, I would then do a column with a running total to give you the system cash position at any point in time. So. If you say at the start of the week, the postmaster has balanced, so he's declared how much cash he's got, so you have to, you know, at some point assume that, that that was correct, so you've got a starting position. You can then work out your system cash position as you go through by adding on all the cash transactions that have taken place. And then at the points at which the postmaster declares cash or declares his overnight cash holding you can see two other figures, well, at least one, you can see what he or she has declared that they are holding at that point. <laughs> and if it's a declare cash or an overnight cash holding where they calculated the, the, the difference, you can also see what the, the system calculates the, the, the cash to be at that time. So going through a week or a month, you've got all these points where you've got two or three figures that you can compare to see how in line they are. Now, if you've got a difference between the first, your own running system total and the cash total that the system has calculated at that point, if those are different, then you have a system problem because of some kind which you can then investigate and see, well, I think the system cash should have been this, but the system is, is that. Why are they different? What's not been included? And so there are some of the bugs that are covered which would fall into that category. Um, and also if you're... Yeah, I'll go back to that. <laughs> but um, then you've got the comparison between what the postmaster has declared he's, he's got and what the calculated figure is and that is your discrepancy which you are then looking for a, a cause for. Now if you've done this over a week sometimes you can see it's, it's in step as it should be these figures are all in step except the one day suddenly it jumps and suddenly you've got a discrepancy of £2,000 so then on that day <laughs> You look at all the transactions to see if you can see anything, either system error or user error, that could possibly have caused a discrepancy of £2,000. And just stopping there, how would you determine whether the discrepancy was user error or system error? You can't. You just said you would determine whether it was system error or user error. Well, you can look... If you, can, if you can see something like a REM of the same pouch has gone in three or four times, then that's fairly likely. I, either the postmaster has been got really carried away and has scanned the thing several times, which shouldn't be allowed to happen anyway, um, or 
it's a good working hypothesis that you have some sort of system error with that, so then you need to look and see exactly what has happened. But if you look at all these, I mean, you'd start out just by looking at the cash transactions and the, the different modes. If you can't see anything anywhere that gives you any sort of a clue, it doesn't seem to be particularly low on one particular day or anything. Um, you may not be able to, it, there, in that, those cases, and it did happen, if there's no sign of any system error, the, 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 the calculated system figure is correct. All that is wrong is the difference between the system figure and what the postmaster says, has declared that they've got then unless you've got the knowledge of what has taken place at the branch in, and have some way of checking that what is recorded on the system actually matches what happened at the branch, then you are not going to get any further. And in that, we're going to come back to this a little later on today, but in that case, where you couldn't positively identify a system error, was the ticket written up as user error? Not normally, no. It would normally be as no evidence of a system error. And what was the consequence of writing a ticket up, no evidence of a system error? It would go back through the lines of support and then it would be up to the postmaster and NBSC to see if they could pursue it any further. What do you mean by pursue it any further? Whether... And hindsight is a wonderful thing, but when I first started doing these sort of things, I sort of assumed that perhaps somebody within the post office organisation would go and help the postmaster um, to discover where something might be going wrong. Why did you assume that? Because that seemed a reasonable thing to, to happen. Did um, you have any positive evidence that that did happen? No, and from talking to postmasters, when I sort of said, well, you know, maybe your manager could help, um, I didn't often get any very positive feedback to, those, to that suggestion. Were you told that, in fact, what happened was that if you wrote off a ticket, uh, or wrote up a ticket which said no evidence of system error, um, that the uh, consequence of that would be that the sub-postmaster would pay, would no. have to pay? No, I didn't. Certainly early on, I did not realise that. Uh, after early on, when did you realise it? Um, I suppose when cases started going to, to court. Um, can you date that? 2005. Did that affect the way that you conducted yourself after then? I don't think so, because I was still, you know, my job was to try and identify system errors. And, you know, you, you can't, I think, turn around and say, oh, well, it might be a system error, but I can't find it. Not in a case where there is, not when there's, You know, there, there is so much variability, shall we say, on the, 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 the customer side. In any event, we'll come back to that uh, a, a little later on. Um, can we um, look, please, at Fujitsu 308 um, please? Can we start, please, at page two? Um, this is a series of emails that you became involved in um, in 2006 concerning the data tree build failure uh, that we're going to look at um, later. But just to orientate um, yourself, um, this is some six years into the operation of... I don't think this is quite to do with that. Oh, isn't it? Well, let's go down and look at Kimberly Yip's message at the foot of the page, please. Uh, 
Um, you'll see you're not involved in this, but it's the background to but it. I had, yes, yeah. Um, you're, you're not a copy yet. No. Um, you'll see that um, this is about performance speed, I think. Yes, it, it was the performance of them producing their balance reports. And, um, but it's not the same as the data, as data tree, tree. Okay. problem. Um, Miss Yip sends an email to Graham Welsh. Um, who was Graham Welsh? Um, customer services manager. We've got some documents that suggest his job title was Fujitsu's strategic services manager for the post office account. I think he had various job titles over the years. Um, but you, you would put him down as customer services, essentially? Yes, I think at that point that was... He, he was part of the service management team, if, if not the leader of the service management team. Um, anyway, Ms Yip says to him, please forgive me if you're not the appropriate person to forward this email to. I've been contacted again by the poll service line to obtain an update on progress on the current Horizon system performance issues. One, branch, one particular branch has been escalated to me, um, and then the identity of the branch is given. And the last rollover timings have been sent to me by Anne Chambers, see below. From 1,700 hours, the branch started printing the daily reports, and this continued until about 1,830 hours. They then declared stamps and cash and pressed the balance report button at 1,837 hours. The trial balance was not printed until, until 21, 12 hours, i.e. over two and a half hours later. Much of this time, the system was processing the month's transactions. There's a gap between 1930 hours and 2005 hours when it may have been waiting for input from the postmaster, but I can't be certain. After the trial balance, um, the report was abandoned, presumably because the postmaster needed to check and resolve the discrepancies. At 21.27 hours, cash and stamps were redeclared with some variation from the original, and at 21.28 hours, the balance report button was pressed again. The second trial balance was printed at 22.58 hours, one and a half hours, and the final balance at 23.04 hours. I've looked at what was going on during the balance report production. Nothing out of the ordinary apart from the very large number of transactions being processed, about 40,000. The number of transactions processed per second was rather less than we sometimes see, but not uh, significantly so, apart from the period 1900 hours to 1910 hours when the counter end of day processes were running. Anne also provided me with some recommendations which I've passed on to the branch and um, which I will ask um, FS to do a similar exercise to the one above, i.e. provide timings when the next TP rollover is completed, 14th of June 2006, to see if there are any significant improvements. I've been told about another branch, so I'm hoping to do a similar <laughs> exercise. In both cases, the rollover times do seem excessive. My worry is that these are not isolated incidents. So in terms of the time it's taking branches to complete the balance process, can FS provide me with details on what constitutes an acceptable length of time? For example, if it takes four hours, then this is reasonable. Or if it's more than five hours, then it needs investigating, etc. This will then give me a better understanding on what I should be passing on to FS or if I should be passing on the recommendations to um, implement. Uh, one of the recommendations was to roll balance period um, every week. Uh, can you confirm that this does reduce the overall time to take and to roll into a new TP at the end of the period? Um, if you need any clarification, don't hesitate to contact me. Then if we scroll back up the page, please. We can see that um, Mr. Welsh forwards this um, to... Uh, you and to um, John Burton. Um, Anne, can you please comment on the attached? And then John, the issue is getting, sorry, this issue is getting silly in the amount of time and resource being applied for a system that is performing to design. Yes, I know, but frankly, the level of grief and support required um, is uh, crazy. And then if we go um, to the message at the top of the page.
we can see that Mr. Burton replies, Graham, I see exactly what you mean by coincidence. I'm reviewing Gareth's report on this issue tomorrow morning before it's submitted to post office. I gather it quotes some hefty prices for making improvements, but I'll be better informed after the review. And then further up the page, please. Uh, your reply on the same day. John, I've looked at many branches now, and they range from very slow to horrifically slow when rolling over stock units. It does vary depending on the particular process followed at each branch. And if you break it down into various components, each may appear to be just within four hours, as long as the weekly rollover used to be. Uh, but the impact on the postmasters is horrible. There have been some piecemeal changes to try and improve certain areas, but most of these have made little improvement and overall may have been a waste of effort. As I see, there are two main problems. The balancing process repeatedly scans and rebuilds the data tree. This was identified as a problem at least six months ago, and improvements to this are, I think, what Gareth is proposing. Two, counters are inadequate for the applications now being run on them and do generally run slowly at times. This hasn't really been fully investigated and is really difficult to quantify or prove that it's happening. The only evidence is what the postmaster reports. It's, however, adding to customer dissatisfaction and could get worse, even if we improve balancing. I'm not at all happy about fobbing postmasters off and telling them that the system is working as designed when it, pla when it is plainly inadequate for the job. I'm also very unhappy that it's taken six months even to, the get, to get to the point of starting to consider whether post office will pay for improvements. I too would like guidance on, whether, on when second and third line support should investigate further. Our current response has to be, yes, we know balancing is very slow. It's being investigate, investigated. What else can we slow, say? You said in your course of your reply there, um, they, that's the um, uh, times, range from um, very slow to horrifically slow. How wide a sample um, did you take when giving that answer, if you can recall? Um, hundreds, I think. I can't exactly remember, but I did. We, we got calls coming in about it. Um, I haven't recently seen any call that I sent off to development, but I'm, I'm sure we did. And the initial response that we got back from development was, oh, well, it was agreed with post office that um, it wouldn't take more than four times as, as long as the, because they, they used to have to roll over every week. So now they're only having to roll over once every four weeks, although they can still roll into a new balance period each week. Um, and Apparently, it had been agreed that as long as it, the overall process was no longer than, than four times what it had been previously, that, that would be all right. But in, in practice, it was having a big impact on branches, which I was well aware of. And what kind of delays are we therefore talking about? Well, you had some of the timings below, so you know, it was... And were they typical the timings we saw below or, or atypical? That was not untypical. You said that the impact on postmasters is horrible. Uh, what was the horrible impact on postmasters? Well, they were having to, I'm sure the postmasters could answer this one for you, but they were having to sit there after end of trading on Wednesday and instead of getting it all done and being out of the door in an hour, an hour and a half or whatever, you know, they still might be there five, six hours later. With a final balance, as we saw in that example of um, just after 11 p.m.? <laughs> And obviously, if during the process they did find they'd got discrepancies, which are not unusual things to happen at branches, but then they would have to go back and check and perhaps recount their cash and, and look for anything. And so it, you know, it wasn't a sit down, press a button and, and off it all goes. They were having to do a, a great deal behind the scenes. You say that the problem had been identified six months ago. Uh, but nothing effective had been done about it? I think we'd been aware of the problem since the switch from every week cash account periods to um, where they changed to balance periods and trading periods. Wasn't that um, in 2004? Um, I thought it was later than that. Maybe I've... I'm not sure. I can't remember. But in any event, this email suggests that the, you knew that the 
problem had existed for at least six months. What had been done in that six months, to your knowledge? I don't know. You say, um, I'm not at all happy about fobbing off um, sub-postmasters and telling the, them the system's working to design. Yes, uh, I wasn't, because I had spoken to quite a few of these postmasters and I could tell how unhappy they were. I think this email, I obviously was trying to get my point across forcefully and I was slightly sticking my neck out, but I felt I was a little bit closer to the people who were having the problems, perhaps, than, than um, someone like John Burton, who I think was the counter development manager. Is what you had been doing for at least that six months period then being fob off to fob off sub postmasters? Um, no, I would have been answering the calls and trying to explain that um, it was expected that it would be a slower process now that they were having to do. Um, n now that the, the process had changed. Um, but I, I did feel it. We, we, I, I was concerned that it was having a big impact and that, as far as I had seen, um, nothing very much had changed, although I think there were a couple of code fixes that I, this suggests that, that something had been changed that was meant to make it better, but perhaps didn't really help very much. Mr. Um, Welsh had said that um, the issue was a silly one and that resources within Fujitsu were being uh, applied to a system that was performing to uh, design. You were unhappy about telling postmasters that the system was performing to design, correct? Yes, given the impact that it was, was having on them. The suggestion that you should say to sub-postmasters um, the system is performing to um, design, was that indicative of a more general approach that you were required to take within the SSC, i.e. don't reveal the true position that we know about publicly or to the sub-postmasters, just say that the system is working well and to, to design? I said it in this case because that was what I had been assured of, um, but no, I would not have said it in other cases where they'd, been, they'd had a problem that was caused by a system error. In that case, I would say to them, um, sorry, the, the system has, there, there's an error here, this shouldn't have happened, it's a fault in the system which we'll be investigating. Was there pressure on you um, in your communications with sub-postmasters? not to reveal um, errors in the system? No. Nope. On this instance, on this email that we've got, it tends to suggest that there had been a message that you were required to deliver. You had been fobbing them off and said the system is working to design. Um, no, I think I, I would have said, <laughs> I know it's awful, but I am told that the system is working to design, but we are still looking at it, something like that. I wouldn't have tried to pretend that it wasn't a problem. Uh, scrolling up the page, uh, please. But we can see Mr. Burton's response. Um, Anne Graham, I've reviewed Gareth's feasibility report and costings this morning to understand things better than I did. His report is based on a great deal of prototyping work that's been done over the last few months of the order of 100 man days. The work looked at a number of options and has homed in um, on the one that gave the best improvements along the lines you mentioned in your first point. The report should go into post office next week. It'll then be up to them whether or not they want to pay us to do the work. If they decide to go ahead, we're looking at a likely delivery date of first calendar quarter in 2007. That would give around two years of useful life before being overtaken by HNGX, Horizon Online. I can understand your frustration at having to deal with irate uh, postmasters and having to tell them the system is working to its spec. We can only hope that Pole 
uh, do agree to funding this work, so you then have something positive to say. Now, I can't see much point second and third line support doing further investigation when we know what needs to be done to make a substantial improvement. Please say, Gareth, if you disagree. And I should say that um, Mr Jenkins was copied into that um, email. Were you content with that response? Yes, I think so. It looked, you know, at least something was happening. Um, I mean, what, what more could I do? Uh, to your knowledge, did uh, the post office ever pay for the improvements that were proposed? Or did um, they instead wait until Horizon Online was rolled out? No, something did change and it did improve. Uh, when was that? I can't remember. Can you remember um, the nature of the improvement? No. Um, I almost certainly would have looked to see, you know, to make sure that it really had made a significant difference. Sorry, can you say that last answer again? I was distracted. Um, I, 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 I'm sure that when the change did go in, and I can't remember when that was, I would have had a look to see if it had improved the time it was taking for some of these worst affected postmasters. Can we look um, at a, 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 di a different issue, but on the same um, topic of um, uh, improvements in the, uh, in the system? and look at poll four zeros, one, two, six, five. You'll see that this is a peak um, dated, you'll see the opening line of the peak under progress narrative mm -hmm. of the 27th of March, 2000. Um, and six, and you'll see under the summary, two lines above, um, what the, uh, the summary of it is, namely a harvester exception. Can you explain in brief terms what a harvester exception is, please? Right, so the transactions are written to the message store on the counter from where they replicate to the message stores at the correspondence servers. Overnight processes run to harvest transactions so they can be sent on to various sources. Um, so, for example, all the bill payments would have to go off to the various companies whose bills were being paid. All the EPOS transactions were harvested along with others to go to post office. Um, in this case, for some reason, it's trying to harvest a message for EPOS. And I can only see this top bit so far, but the message written on the counter um, presumably does not have the mode field which should have been included in it. Because it was blank. That appears to be the case from all I can see so far. Yes. And then if we scroll down, please, you make an entry at the foot of the page um, on the same day, the um, ticket having been assigned to you, um, your entry of the 27th of March at 16, 12, 36... Mm -hmm. um, I've repaired the problem transaction and will check tomorrow that it has been sent okay. As far as I can tell, no call has gone to development about this. To summarise, some messages get written with a null mode attribute. The root cause of this has never been resolved. Changes have been made to the harvester agents so that the messages with, and then you put a character string, can be installed when mode is missing. Um, mails balance messages have, and then um, you put some more character strings. This was spotted soon after their introduction in January, and I did intend to raise a peak, but don't seem to have done so. At the time, it was thought to be benign. Uh, males balance messages with a missing mode are now causing a number of harvester exceptions, five on the reports for 24-3. What does that mean for 24-3? For the 24th of March? 24th of March, yeah. yeah. Um, each has to be repaired individually. 
So we need to sort out the character string issue. This um, could be fixed either at the agent or in the mail scripts. If it can, fail, can be fixed fairly soon in the scripts, I think that would be the better option rather than making the agent cope with what is basically a, um, a typo. There are example messages in the attached reports, or I can provide a message storage required routing to mail's um, development team, essentially, uh -huh. yes? And then um, in the next messages, if we scroll down, I'm not going to go through them in the interest of time, no need to read them. We can see that... Um, your suggestion about the investigation of the, um, the root cause um, was not taken up and a decision was taken not to do that because it wouldn't be cost effective given the limit, limited shelf life of the Horizon Counter application. Mm -hmm. uh, can we see um, your response to that on page three of the document, please? at um, 1354 and 33, that's it, third up. Um, response noted, you say, I never really expected the root cause to be investigated or fixed. The typo which caused the agent circumvention to fail was fixed a long time ago, closing call. Mm -hmm. you, you had earlier suggested that the root cause be investigated and... Um, um, and fixed. No, I think I, I said just changed where it was application mails. Just make sure. Do you want to just go back up to that at yeah, page one? Sorry. The last few lines. Page one, scroll down. Thank you. Further. No, I said we need to sort out the applications mails issue. That wasn't the root cause. The root cause was the null mode attribute. And so the message that you wrote at the, um, at the end, I never really expected the root cause to be investigated yeah. or fixed. Yeah, that's the messages with the null mode attribute. I see. And so in essence, you're saying here that what you expected to be done was done. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, that can come down. In your um, witness statement at paragraph 17, there's um, no need to turn it up, you say that um, the SSC and fourth line support development um, did not always know how many branches had reported a particular problem because the tickets reporting a, that problem hadn't been sent through to the SSC. Yes? Yeah. Was that a problem? Um, it was if we didn't therefore have an idea of the, the, the scale of a, a problem or how many branches were being affected. Was that known within Fujitsu that there was a problem in the design of the system as a whole? in that relevant information was not being passed up to the SSC? I don't know. Um... Well, you've identified this as a problem. Mm. Was um, that problem discussed amongst your team, raised with your manager, and then escalated uh, within Fujitsu and then within the post office? Not to my knowledge. And why but not? It, if this was a, a problem in the system that meant that the scale of any identified defect was not known, why wasn't that addressed? I don't know. It would be I mean, relevant. There, there would be other ways of finding out that information. Um, I mean, in the, it would it would depend very much on the the type of problem. But 
we're not talking here about things that would have a well, we shouldn't be talking about things that would have a significant effect on individual branches. Um, How but I think it was just understood that you know, th this was the, the, the process was that first and second line are meant to filter out known errors. That is why they are there. If you're saying, well, first and second line need to send everything through anyway, then you can almost say, what's the point of having them? Would you agree, though, that with the benefit of hindsight, this is a, a problem or a defect within the system? I think there are there were certainly some areas where it would have been a lot better if SSC or, or somebody had had more of a insight into how particular problems were affecting the entire, the entire estate. I mean, that's a, a key issue, is it not, for both the post office and Fujitsu. A person has identified a problem. To what extent has that problem in the past aff afflicted the estate? Or to what extent is it currently afflicting the post office yeah. estate? But there are other ways of finding out that information besides having calls passed through for every time it's reported. I mean, you could argue that then you're dependent on the postmaster actually noticing and, and reporting the problem. And there were, we'd also have other means of seeing how often a specific problem had occurred by, for example, checking the events for the whole estate over a certain period of time. Um, it would just depend what the, the signature of the problem was. In many cases, we, we would be able to, um, to see where else had been affected. Was that habitually done, that when a problem, when a ticket came in, you would adopt that approach of um, checking the message store for the entirety of the estate? Not when a ticket came in, but when an underlying problem had to be identified, then certainly later on in the life of Horizon and particular HNGX, yes, that was done very rigorous, rigorously. Good. But I cannot say that that was done um, the whole time. So when you say later on, earlier. I'm sorry, I spoke over you. When you um, say later on, when do you mean? Um, certainly from the introduction of HNGX, I think we got a lot better at tracking down every instance of problems without the postmaster having to report it to us. Why wasn't this done before the introduction of um, Horizon Online in 2010? I think in some cases it was done, but perhaps not so rigorously. But why was it done? I don't know. Why not? Well, can you help, um, please? <laughs> w what determined whether before 2010 uh, you would say, "Well, I've got a problem here. It's on this ticket. Um, I need to um, make a decision on whether to check." the extent to which this problem is uh, afflicting other parts of the estate? It would, again, partly depend on what type of a, a problem it was, um, how easy it was to, to do those sort of checks. Um, Were there any rules on this, anything written down? No, I don't believe so. Was it down to individual discretion of the 25 of you? Yes, or probably more down to that. But, I mean, a problem of any scale, it's, it's unlikely that it's just one person ends up looking at it anyway, so you wouldn't, it wouldn't be sort of one in 25. But, um, and it, it would depend on, obviously, on, on what sort of a problem was and what sort of impact it was having. And what do you mean by what sort of impact? Well, if it, it was affecting branch accounts in some way. If it was affecting branch accounts in some way, would, would you habitually do a, an estate? Do hold on, hold on. Would you do an estate-wide check 
to see whether other branches' accounts have been afflicted by the problem identified. You, you might well attempt to. What would determine whether you might well? Whether there was some clear-cut way of, of identifying these branches. Was there a clear-cut way of identifying? It, it would depend on the problem. You can't generalise. Would you escalate issues where you think um, this is a significant um, issue that might afflict other branches or some other branches? Again, I think that was something we <sighs> that happened more subsequent uh, HNGX onwards. You address this, if we can look at it, please, in paragraph 53 of your witness statement, which is on page 17. Uh, you say in the first sentence, I'm asked whether Fujitsu took proactive steps to identify bugs and or discrepancies in branch, uh, branch accounts caused by the same. And then reading on four or five lines, you say if a bug was found to be affecting branch accounts which had not caused a reconciliation report entry, we would do our best to identify all branches affected as we did for bug three. However, I cannot say that this was done consistently for all bugs ever found, especially in the early days of the project. Mm. So my question is why was it not done consistently for all bugs. I, I think perhaps we... I, I don't know. I can't answer that question. To what extent was there liaison with the post office when identifying whether there should be an estate-wide search for the extent of a problem? Um, again, I know that a, a lot of the problems that happened... HNGX onwards, there, there was liaison with them and discussion as to how to do these searches and um, who should be undertaking them. What about the decade before then? Um, I think I'm, one reason I'm finding it so hard to remember is that I've seen very little, very few peaks and it, things from that period sort of 2007 to 2010 in particular. So I really am finding it very, very hard to remember. You know, I, I can't turn around and say, oh, yes, we did this, 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 and this. Um, because my memory hasn't really been jogged by specific instances. How um, did you interact with the MSU in this situation? Uh, did, did you highlight um, this kind of situation to them so that they could let all branches know to be on the lookout for a known problem? Um, that wasn't really MSU's role. We, that was very much a branch-by-branch branch basis. Was there any liaison with the post office about... Um, I'm talking about pre-2010 here... Um, at notification of uh, the discovery of a bug and to look out for symptoms or signs of its existence? I'm sure there was some, but I've not seen any specific examples in the last six months. You say in paragraph 212 of your witness statement, if we go to that, please, it's right at the end on page 63... A point of frustration with the system was that the users, namely the sub-postmasters, 
were not our clients and there was a practical limit as to the extent to which we could work together with them to investigate um, uh, problems. Are you, um, by this, suggesting that each problem that was called in by a sub-postmaster was treated um, separately and that, as a result, there wasn't any oversight of any wider system issues? No, I think what I was trying to say there was that, you know, there were cases where you just wished you had some way of knowing what had happened at the branch and could, and there was some way of, of getting some more information. Did you, in the first 10 years of the project, um, take the view that um, tickets were sent in, were addressed piecemeal, one by one, problems were patched up, and there was no analysis of whether the issues, the fundamental issues raised by the tickets needed to be addressed coherently through any redevelopment or redesign? Um, no, I think there was, there, there certainly was analysis done and where we saw patterns emerging, we did try to make sure those problems were, were progressed. Can we um, look at an example, please, of where you suggested, I think, that um, others take a wider look at the system? Uh, FUJ 3086490. Thank you. And if we expand it, thank you. We're going to come back to this um, peak in due course when we look at um, bug 10, the data tree field, sorry, the data tree build um, failures. But I just want to look at it now to explore a couple of issues with you just on the back of this peak. Uh, you'll see that the summary of the problem um, is discrepancies when declaring euros or cash. Can you see that? the fifth line in, sixth line in, thank you. And uh, we can see if we scroll down a little bit that it was raised on the 18th of May 2007 under the first entry on the progress narrative. And then if we can look at page three of this peak, please. And um, the entry at 10.45.06 on the 24th of May, made by you. And you say this branch reports they have been having problems since March 2006, um, remembering we're now in May 2007, where they do declarations, do further transactions, usually transfers or REMs, redeclare, and then get a discrepancy equal to the value of the recent transactions. Um, two recent examples, um, all times UTC. Wednesday, the 16th of May, 2,000 euros transferred out at 1423 hours, then reported as a discrepancy during trial balance at 1554 hours. Monday, the 21st of May, eight cash, cash transactions totaling 2,465 pounds between 0935 hours and 1016 hours, ignored when cash declared subsequently at 1020 hours. The problems are always in stock unit MS, which is an individual stock unit. Hence, a variance check is run automatically after a cash declaration, almost always using the gateway for this stock unit. These types of errors are not that unusual these days. I would say much less rare than a couple of years ago, question mark. We usually quote, and then you give a kel. I think the outcome of those investigations was that the repost message port was possibly sometimes failing. However, given that this problem is not uncommon at this branch, and that also that uh, another um, peak found a problem within Horizon that gave very, very similar consequences, I think this might be worth a recheck. I appreciate that with Horizon Online coming up, uh, it may not be worth um, pursuing this. 
that this problem is causing a number of postmasters to have serious doubts about the reliability of their systems, since they're very obviously displaying incorrect um, figures. And then if we also look at your entry uh, on page four, at 11, 16, 12, Thank you, just at the foot of the page there. Thank you. And so we're um, uh, three months on now. Um, sorry, two months on now. This problem is continuing to affect a number of branches, especially larger ones, where they have individual stock units and commonly where they've transferred out cash, which then appears as if it is still in the stock unit. Hence, they think there is something wrong with the transfer mechanism. The postmasters are not at all happy that the system is giving them incorrect figures causing much confusion and potentially creating um, opportunities for fraud. And so in this peak, we see how a, a multi-branch issue involving discrepancies was suggested to be brought together for a proper fix by you. Is that right? Uh, yes. But would this be right? That was as a result of your essentially anecdotal experience of an increasing number of calls of a similar nature. Yes, I was probably keeping an eye out for these type of calls. And you kept a, an eye out mm -hmm. for these calls and some branches had experienced a, a continuing problem for a number of years and various workarounds were employed. Yes. But ultimately, the suggestion of a fix was um, essentially ad hoc by you, wasn't it? I'm not sure what you mean. I mean that it was just you keeping a weather eye out for whether this was a problem that was affecting uh, consistently a number of branches, rather than the, the system that Fujitsu employed itself detecting whether this was a consistent and ongoing problem. Yes. And was that essentially the approach adopted in the SSC? It was down to you as an individual to keep a weather eye out to see whether there was a big problem or not? Yes, I think that's probably true. Would you accept that... Um, that rather um, patchwork approach dependent on 25 individuals, not each knowing what the other is doing, not each knowing what the other is seeing, may leave frailties in the system. It could do, although I would say, I mean, I wasn't just looking at the calls that I had dealt with. I would have been, have noticed that some of my colleagues had also had similar calls, and in fact, well, we would have discussed it together. Um, but the processes that we were meant to follow was to, you know, you pass the, the call over to development, and then it is their responsibility to produce the fix at some point in the, the future. I mean, there were... teams or there were people who would see which calls were with development sort of in potentially in the pipeline and so on um, but yes them actually having anybody having the knowledge of something like this where it was a continuing potentially serious <laughs> problem um, they, th that information was not necessarily being fed in. Um. Thank you very much, um, Mr Chambers. Um, if that's an appropriate moment yes, for you, so I would suggest we break until two. Well, to give everybody their full hour, five past, Mr Beer, provided the time on my machine in front of me is accurate at 13.03. I've got um, 12.59. Really? Oh. Well, it just shows how reliable this system is. Yes. Fine. 
Well, that's um, compromise. Two minutes past two. Thank you very much, sir.